This program is supported by members of WFIU, Public Radio for Indiana. Thanks. There is a restaurant in almost every street in our various cities. They are woven into the fabrics of our communities and they are deeply embedded in our lives. Restaurants are the places we go to celebrate marriages, to mourn divorces, the places we go to gossip with friends, to celebrate after church. They become these places to hear the stories of their community. They're talking to the farmers every day. They're talking to the fisher people every day. They're talking to the other producers. They're also getting a sense of what's challenging about their lives or what's opportunities within their lives. And then they hear the everyday concerns of their customers. So they become these great collectors of stories. This week on the show, Catherine Miller, author of At the Table, The Chef's Guide to Advocacy. She encourages chefs to harness the power of their unique position in the community and raise their voices for change in the food system. Our conversation is just ahead. Thanks for listening to Earth Eats. I'm Kate Young. I think many of us can relate to the feeling of wanting to make the world a better place, but not always knowing the path for being the change we want to see in the world. My guest this week has made it part of her work to help people find their voices and advocate for the causes that matter to them. In particular, she works with chefs through the James Beard Foundation's Chef's Boot Camp for Policy and Change. Catherine Miller has a new book out called At the Table, where she shares the strategies and tools she's developed over the years to help chefs tap into their unique powers to fight for change in our food system. My name is Catherine Miller, and I'm the author of At the Table, The Chef's Guide to Advocacy, and I'm also the founder of a consulting firm called Table 81 here in Washington, D.C. I would like to start by hearing a little bit about your story. What is your relationship to the industry, to the restaurant industry, and how did you find your way into this kind of work? You know, I have had a career, which I call a career in thirds. I spent about a third of my career working in hardcore American politics and then moved into the nonprofit and foundation sector where I built large-scale campaigns focused on global health issues like polio and malaria, gender equity. And when I transitioned into becoming a consultant and working for different foundations and organizations, I really loved doing trainings. Like I love empowering people to have the tools that they need to do the thing that they want to do in life, whether that's be an advocate or fight for landholder rights or talk about education. So I was doing a lot of trainings and some I was doing internationally. And uh, two trustees of the James Beard Foundation came to me and said, hey, we have this idea. We'd love to train celebrity chefs to become to Capitol Hill and get involved in food issues. And I told them that was the craziest thing that I had ever heard in my life, using much more colorful language than that, and was like, no, I'm not going to do that. And, you know, for a variety of reasons, they stayed after me and they were like, can you please come do this? And um, ultimately I did. I, I did the first Chef's Boot Camp for Policy and Change, which is a longtime program at the James Beard Foundation now. And I designed that curriculum and led that training for the eight of the 10 years that it's been around. And then what I realized through all of that work was that I did have this random tie to the restaurant industry in a couple of ways. I mean, one was that I, like most Americans, and really most Americans, had some of my first jobs at a restaurant or in food service, whether it was the concession stand at the movie theater or whether it was actually in my family-owned restaurant, which I just, it, it hadn't occurred to me till like sort of midway through the second year of the training. And one of the chefs asked, and I was like, oh, yeah, my family owns a restaurant in a small town in Florida, and I used to wait tables there, and I was really bad at it. And so, you know, I think most of us have a food service story in our backgrounds. Uh, we were either waiters or waitresses, servers, barbacks, scooped popcorn, something. So, you know, I, I love this work. I think that that's sort of that it actually touches every single one of our lives in different ways. So, so yeah, so I, you know, career in thirds, working at politics and then working on campaigns and then, 
you know, doing trainings and other consultant pieces. And then, you know, the, the Beard Foundation asked me to do this training and 10 years ago plus. Yeah. The book is called At the Table, and it's The Chef's Guide to Advocacy. And I think sometimes folks in the nonprofit world really think that terms like advocacy are understood by everyone. And I think that's maybe not always the case. So I was wondering if you could spell that out for us. Sure. What is advocacy? Yeah, I mean, advocacy is when any of us use our voice in support of the causes that we care about. And I think the slight difference and, and distinction that I get to in the book a little is, you know, there are different phases of one's advocacy and different tenors in which it can take. So you can be, you know, I always ask chefs, are you an activist or are you an advocate? And I think being an advocate is when you go through the process of deep learning, um, figuring out who has already done the work before you and how you can support them, figuring out who your network of allies and relationships where those lie, and, and figuring out how much time you have to give to a particular cause. I think there's a, a difference. But advocacy is when any of us use our voice, our power, our personal power to champion the causes that we care most about. And I, so I think of, often we, are, we don't think we're advocates when we really are. And what is the difference in your mind between advocacy and activism? I mean, I think they're sort of on the spectrum of, of what you do. I always talk about advocacy as sort of a walk through the forest with my family. You have the kids that run ahead and they're passionate and they're, they're like, we're going, we're gone. Like, we're going to do this thing. And then you have the folks sort of in the middle who are kind of keeping an eye on the there. And then you have the folks in the back who are like a little slower to come along. So in our own personal journeys with advocacy, I often think about that. that there are different places for voice in there. I think activists, and I consider myself very much an activist on certain issues, are those folks that are literally at the front lines, at the front lines of the barricades with the signs, with the protests, really becoming among the first to shine attention and light onto things. I think advocates are probably a little bit more methodical often and it it's deeper and you can be both you can hold both obviously but I think being an advocate really is and this is a point I try and make in the book which is it's really a practice and it's an ongoing thing and it requires you to have the same skills and intention that you would have with other things in your life and so you know I, I tend to think of activists as those who are really like the first to show us a problem is happening and the advocates are sort of, okay, let's, how do we solve this problem and bring the most people to the table? And how do we make the most people to help us create the change we want to see? Yeah. And you also make a distinction in the book about the difference between political and partisan and in encourage people to not shy away from being political and that it doesn't mean the same thing. Could you t say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an incredibly fraught thing right now. We are surrounded by this constant noise of politics and partisanship and almost segmented aspects of our society. And when we think about policy, policy is the thing that really does actually control our lives, right? I mean, it is the thing that controls what types of food we can eat, how much those foods cost, who can grow on which land, what that land can be used for, and how those different products are subsidized. So like policy is actually a thing. And the challenge with that is policy is also compromise. So you have to be able to bring different people to the table and you actually have to be able to transcend partisanship because ultimately you're going to have to work with other people, whether there are other people in your community, whether there are other people in Congress, whether there are other people in the administration. And, you know, we are, we are challenged by that right now. I think it's a really fraught and difficult time. But if we can think about, you know, an exercise I do with almost every training is I ask people, you know, about a common societal thing, like, do you agree or disagree that children should go hungry? And if you say, know that child, no child should be hungry, everybody raises their hand. No one wants to see children go hungry. Every single person has a different prescription or different idea of how you prevent those children from going hungry. 
whether it's that the government should fund it, whether it's that communities should fund it, whether it's churches, whether they're parents. And so our prescriptions start to get in our way and sort of meld with our, our sort of partisanship. Or, and so I very much want people to understand with this book, and I think that chefs are sort of a unique place about this with our food system, to understand that policy is about compromise and compromise is about putting the most people at the table to kind of figure out how to find a solution to the problems that we're trying to solve. And you're going to do that by opening conversations and inviting them in. You're not going to do that by looking at them and saying, you're a Democrat, you're a Republican, you're an independent, I can't talk to you. Can you say more about how it is that chefs are well positioned to be advocates and how how you think that they can make a real difference in food policy? Yeah, I mean, the, the sort of penny that dropped for me related to chefs is that they are there is a restaurant in almost every street in our in our various cities. They are woven into the fabrics of our communities and they are deeply embedded in our lives. They are the places that rest, restaurants are the places we go to celebrate marriages, to you know mourn divorces, or the place we go to sign our forced mortgage payments. They are the places we go to gossip with friends, to celebrate after church. Like they they are woven into our everyday lives and so you know, one, chefs are those sort of trusted community members. You know though, you know that restaurant, you know the person that owns it, you know the the chef whose food you eat. They're also trusted because frankly, we expect to be safe. We don't expect for the food to kill us. And so there's like an in, uh, inherent trust there. So there's one, there's a lot of trust. Two, you know, they are sitting at every community and they become these places to hear the stories of their community. They're talking to the farmers every day. They're talking to the fisher people every day. They're talking to the other producers. So they're getting a sense of like what's selling, what's not, but they're also getting a sense of what's challenging about their lives or what's opportunities within their lives. And then they hear the everyday concerns of their customers. So they become these great collectors of stories. And then, you know, they have access like very few community-based spokespeople do because of the physical nature of a restaurant, which is where politicians go to eat, go to raise money, go to meet with constituents. They themselves take their families out So there's actually a point of access that the rest of us really don't have. Another exercise that I do is, you know, ask how many people have had a governor or how many people have had a city councilman into their place? How many people have had their governor into their restaurant? How many people have hosted a fundraiser for a presidential candidate? And without fail, everyone will raise their hand because they are also that uh, a business where people come. So, you know, I think that they they hold trust, they collect stories, and they have access like nobody's business. And so I think that's what makes them particularly effective, especially when we're talking about community-based solutions and helping articulate community-based solutions to policymakers, whether it be in a state house or whether it be at the federal level. Because really, truly, those members, those governors, those electeds really want to hear from their constituents and these folks are, are sitting at the in their communities, so they also have that sort of relevance to the process that others don't have. Are the, the chefs that you mostly work with, are they, like you said, celebrity chefs initially with the initial James Beard proposal, but is it chefs of all stripes, <laughs> like all, all, you know, sizes and, you know, mom and pop yeah. shop stores and restaurants? Yeah, no, it is. I mean, I think, I mean, one, I think, you know, the, the audience is definitely chefs. And, you know, when I left the James Beard Foundation, there were about a thousand chefs on the waiting list to get through this program. And we were never going to get through them 18 at a time through all of them. And so there's and certainly your publisher, that's the first question they ask you, who's your audience? There's enough chefs out there to to be a credible audience. But my hope is that one of the things, if your food sort of adjacent or you just love to eat, like I'm an eater, I'm not a chef, I'm a home cook, that you'll that you might be drawn in just by wanting to hear about these folks and what the work that they've done and how they've helped translate and accelerate issues. And I think part of that is, you know, to your question about celebrity chef versus, you know, or a mom and pop or an independent, is that we started the program with this intention of celebrity chefs, the people with the most Instagram followers, and then suddenly realized, clearly realized that throughout the process that like, even the biggest chef in the world has only a fraction of the followers of a celeb, a true sort of like celebrity, a Kardashian. I always just always joke that it takes about a hundred chefs to equal one Kardashian. That's the the world of celebrity that we live in. 
But when you think about advocacy and you think about it from a nonprofit organizing s- sector, what you really are looking for is community-based leaders because somebody like a Martha Hoover in Indiana who has multiple restaurants in Indianapolis, she knows everyone. Everyone comes into one of her restaurants. Everyone has had her famous cinnamon toast in Indianapolis. And so all of a sudden, she's a celebrity in her town. And she's a trusted force in her town. And she has that trust, that relevance, and that access. And so suddenly you can turn that into, you know, in marketing parlance, it's the micro-influencer. And it's fantastic because they really are these super authentic storytellers. They have a deep relationship with the communities that they're in. People know who they are. And so it was, it be, over time became less and less about, you know, having the super celebrity chefs that might be well, more well known to the broader scope of America and actually really looking for the people who were deeply embedded in their communities. So can you... Tell us a little bit more about the boot camp. Yeah. So, you know, when I started this work, it was for a pilot project for the James Beard Foundation that was called the Chef's Boot Camp for Policy and Change. And that program continues to this day. And that boot camp is a three-day experiential intensive advocacy retreat where chefs are taken through an advocacy training on how to use their voice. So role plays on how to talk to a member of Congress and deep information sessions on topics like the farm bill or food waste. They're also taken through things like a live animal harvest because the idea being that, you know, how can you talk really talk about food policy unless you know exactly the policies that are in place and the things that have to happen in order for food to get onto your plate. And then there's a, a community dinner because part of the intention of the Chef Boot Camp for Policy and Change is to create a cohort of people who can support each other in their own activism. They can start to find each other and they can be visible to one another. And so that is a, another stated goal of that. It's community building. It's an information and education. It's advocacy training. And then there's a fair bit of like food systems work that's done through the program. And that program was designed to take 15 to 18 chefs at a time through it. It happened three times a year, and it continues to this day. And it's a program I'm incredibly proud to have helped originate and built the curriculum for. And you know, and I'm in part because I think it helps, you know, it helps create also a visible community of allies who are willing to do the work of policy with you. And you're not alone, and I think that's the one thing that advocates often feel is alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so wanting to make, you know, others visible was important too. I think it's particularly exciting because I think a lot of people, just individuals who are dissatisfied with issues in the food system, often think that, oh, I'll just buy this particular food and that's, that's my statement, you know. And that is one way to make a statement. Um, But when you start working on policy, that's when that's when the real change can happen, you know, and when even just one restaurant enters into that, then, you know, that's different. That That's more impact than just one household. And then if you have people at that restaurant who are actually fighting for change at the policy level, I just think that's really exciting and feels very hopeful. I could imagine that it's it's very uplifting work to do. Yeah, I mean, it definitely sort of hits your dopamine in terms of the advocacy piece. But I think what you said is really, is, is sort of how we always talk about it too, which is that you have three three or more opportunities from an advocacy perspective as a chef and really as an eater, which is that all the choices that you make at your table. So are you buying from local farms? Are you buying from a community supported agriculture project? How are you prioritizing that food dollar? Americans spend about 50% of their food dollar outside of their own home. And so prioritizing that is actually important. Those purchases that you make are very important. But then how do we form authentic relationships with the communities? the organizations doing the work in our communities. One of the things we also did in the early days of this, of the boot camp and and programmatically was to audit restaurants and figure out how much money they were donating. In their audits, they found that on average, restaurants were donating about $50,000 a year, but they were donating it to dozens of organizations. And if you think about $50,000, that's a, if you were if you donated fifty thousand dollars to one organization or one cause, you would have a greater impact than if you scatter shot 
you know, $50,001 bills. And so encouraging people to say no and to really hone the issues that they wanted to work on was a big piece of it because you can build more authentic relationships with the communities, your community-based organizations. And that's a very important form of advocacy too. And then the idea of policy is really lasting change. Like it's long, it's a long work. It's three and five years. It's, and it's constant. You constantly have to keep doing it. Every year we fight for funding for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP. Yeah. That battle never stops. Yep. And so policy is both a long tail solution, but it's also a, it's the lasting change that we're fighting for. So if I give you think about advocacy in three ways, you can do it at the table, all the food purchasing decisions you can make, how you get involved in your own community and the organizations that you work with and the depth of that relationship. And then the stuff that you can work on policy and the longer tail stuff. I asked Catherine to say more about what kinds of donations she's talking about. The chefs are like the number one p- person you go to to ask for something for your kid's school, your community organization, your church. Like, hey, can you give us a cookbook? Hey, can you donate a gift certificate? Hey, can you come cook at this event? They are the number one. They are, the, they are your go-to. If you are in a community fundraising event planning situation, and somebody doesn't mention like, oh, let's re- reach out to our restaurant. I will give you five dollars. Like everybody <laughs> asks. Yep. And and the most of them do it for free because most of those organizations aren't like, hey, we'd like to pay you your rate to close down your restaurant for a night so you can come cook at our thing. They want it for free. And so quantifying the hours that were spent, the products that were donated the cost of labor, transportation, the number of gift certificates they're asked for, which they then carry as debt until you use them, by the way, on their books. That just t- added up. And, you know, if you think about uh, Aaron Silverman is a chef in Washington, D.C., and he's in the book because one of the things that he does is that he decided that he was only going to donate and to do things in support of the World Food Program. WFP. And so he has a standard email that he sends when anybody sends him an ask, when anybody's like, hey, will you donate to this Girl Scout troop? Or hey, will you donate to this PTA fundraiser? He's like, you know, we really appreciate your efforts within the community, but our efforts are firmly focused on the World Food Program. And that's who we're donating our time and resources to at this time. And just by being able to say who he supports, he's suddenly not a jerk when he says no to you. Because it's like, oh, I, I, I get it. Like, that's who you support. And so, like, that is also, it's very empowering. But, you know, they, it's, uh, chefs are the number one go-to source for free donations for every organization. And I've always been encouraging them to sort of hone their giving and figure out what they care about so that they can have more impact with the limited resources that they have. Yeah, that's one of the things that I wanted to, to ask you about that is in the book, where you're talking about just really focusing your efforts. And part of that does involve saying no. And I just think that is such an important thing to to include, especially because, as you point out, this is the hospitality industry, and it's all about serving and pleasing. And so it's probably doesn't come naturally for some of these folks to say no. No, I mean, I think it's I think it's baked into the sort of model of hospitality. Like, do you want still or sparkling water? How can I make you more comfortable? Would you like to be at the window? Would you like this? How can I accommodate your likes and your dislikes? How can I serve you? And so that you can, you know, that you'll pay me, that you'll tip me. So there is definitely a aspect of it's an unequal relationship when it comes to hospitality. And so I think that plays itself out in these donations because they are sitting at every street corner and every or you know in every city. And so you don't want to be seen as a, a jerk or not participating or not generous. And so, and so saying, but there's real power in saying no. It's, you know, we say it in our household every year. We sit down at the end of the year and we total up every cash thing that we did at the supermarket, every raffle ticket we bought at a baseball game. And then we we go back through our our philanthropy and we're not billionaires. And we make sure like, oh, okay, well, we did too much of that this year. Let's make sure that we're going to give money to 
the rescue center for in honor of our cat. And that is actually really powerful because then you're at the baseball game and somebody comes and says, oh, do you want to buy this raffle ticket? And you're like, actually, no, I'm going to give to the Humane Society today. But thanks for your work. It's just so much better. I'm speaking with Katherine Miller. She's the author of At the Table, The Chef's Guide to Advocacy. We'll be back with more from our conversation after a short break. Kate Young here. This is Earth Eats. I'm speaking with Katherine Miller. She originated the Chef's Boot Camp for Policy and Change at the James Beard Foundation. And her book, At the Table, was released in September of 2023. Let's return to our conversation. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of some of the areas that really do need addressing in the food system and in particular in the in the restaurant industry that that become some of the places where chefs put their focus. You know, the thing about food systems work is that it is a system. So, you know, you, you can find, anyone can find, a chef can find, you or I could find an issue or a cause to get involved with related to our food system. So we have our fisheries are being overfished and badly managed. So, you know, our fish supplies are going to change dramatically. Climate change is changing the way wine is made around the world. So if you're interested in wine and you want to talk about, you know, why they suddenly are growing some of the f- best champagne in Britain right now, you can find an entry point through climate change. Within the, way, within the restaurant community specifically, I mean, I think there's a lot of work that's done on sourcing so how do we make a food system that is more environmentally sustainable, but also human sustainability is important too. I think there's a lot of work that's been done. I know there's a lot of work that's been done on hunger and nutrition areas. So, you know, hunger is sort of the gateway issue for many chefs. I mean, many of them have themselves have experienced food insecurity. They see it often with people that they work with, and it's an issue that people can really resonate with in terms of chefs delivering messages related to hunger or nutrition. And we've certainly seen a need for more chefs to talk about the business side of the industry. So whether that's health benefits, mental health concerns, whether that's wage and workforce protections, Mm -hmm. you know, so you see it is a system. So there's an issue for everybody in food, but certainly sustainability, environmental sustainability, human sustainability, hunger, nutrition, and then wage and workforce issues are among the top ones that chefs are really most active on, I think. You tell some really great stories in your book about specific chefs and the some of the work that they've done and I was wondering if there is one in particular that you would like to talk about yeah no I mean I think my it continues to be one of my favorite stories because I think it is both a incredibly brave thing that this woman does um, to talk about her own human experience with these issues but you know chef Al Simone is a an African-American woman chef she's the first black chef to appear in America's Test Kitchen. She founded a mentoring organization for women chefs, um, particularly people of color. And she will say very publicly, whenever anybody asks her, that part of the reason that she's able to have that success is because she at one point accepted food stamps. And so there's a real tension in her life about how she has achieved all of this. And in part, it was because when she was at her most in need. There was a program that could help her and she took advantage of it. And I love that she is willing to tell that story because there's so much negative mythology built up around those who use supplemental programs to in, during times of their life. Those programs are meant to help during times of Im- immense crisis. And Elle is kind of the living embodiment of help somebody when they're they're most at need and not only will they succeed and thrive but they will give back um in such a way that is just beautiful to watch and she's she's an amazing human she's an amazing spokesperson for hunger issues she never shies away from it and i just also think it's incredibly brave of anyone to tell their story 
related to that type of hardship, that financial hardship and the decisions that you have to make. And so she's probably my favorite story in the book, but I'm also deeply partial to the work of Patrick Mulvaney and Mulvaney's in um, Sacramento because it was uh, Patrick Mulvaney's a chef and he experienced a great deal of loss um, by death, by suicide in his community. And it was around the same time that Tony Bourdain had a death by, was death by suicide in France. And, you know, Patrick is this large individual, like he's larger than life in all the ways. And to hear him talk about um, that work and to hear his voice sort of crack and the emotion that he shows when he talks about the experience of the people in his kitchen the way those suicides impacted the city of San, um, Sacramento, and then all the hard work that he put into making, trying to make sure that it wouldn't happen again. So he went and found the experts. He went and worked with Kaiser Permanente and Blue Cross Blue Shield California, and he worked with folks at the University of California. And he, I mean, it's just an amazing story of, you know, that's rooted in serious, tragic loss but is also such a beautiful testament to how you can be an effective advocate and go out and get all the things, the training tools, the money. And it's really, it's a beautiful story. Yeah, I I was really moved by that story as well and, and was not aware that there had been so many deaths by suicide in that, in the restaurant community in Sacramento. And some of them had been in his kitchen at some point. And so that must have just been so heartbreaking. And it it was very inspiring to see that his advocacy work was part of what helped the mental health funding pool. Yeah, I think this is like an interesting it. thing too, right? Because I don't think in the case of Elle or Michelle Nishan, who's also in the book, or Patrick Mulvaney, or even Paolo Velez with Bakers Against Racism... I don't think they would be comfortable with thinking that they are leading, okay. right? That they're doing this new thing that no one's done. Mm-hmm. That's actually not the case. What they're doing is they're using their voice and their power to p- pour accelerant on work that is being done to bring new profile and new energy. And that's like the exciting part is like when you can take all of the assets that you have as an advocate, the networks that you have, the social media following that you have, the news, you know, the news media interest, and you can help truly accelerate something. So, you know, I would never say that there wouldn't be increased healthcare benefits for casual workers related to mental health without Patrick Mulvaney, but it sure as heck wouldn't have happened as quickly as it happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. Without him. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying that. I think that's important. I was really, in part because this is a little closer closer to home here, is the story of Chef Edward Lee in Louisville and the, the Lee Initiative. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the Lee Initiative's amazing. Chef Edward Lee, he's a multi-James Beard Award winner, has a number of restaurants in Louisville, Washington, D.C., Virginia. And, you know, it's probably actually probably best known in the region as like the, the chef with the best bourbon connection for <laughs> um, he and his co-founder, Lindsay of Kasich, uh, created this organization in the wake of Me Too, where they had realized that there was sort of a statistical cliff that women were falling off of in the culinary industry. So like you'd get through culinary school, most of the most of the people in culinary school are women. Most of the people who work in restaurants are women. And yet there's this total leadership cliff. They don't make it to head chef. They don't make it to owner. They don't make it to manager. And it's a combination of a variety of factors. There's no mentors. It's an incredibly brutal environment to work in. It's not conducive to having a family. All, all of, It doesn't provide a lot of benefits in a lot of cases. And so it's not exactly a place for you. And so Lindsay and you know Lee uh, Edward were looking for something to do. And so they originally created a mentorship program that was women who work in culinary, particularly in the Kentucky area, particularly in Louisville at the beginning, because they also wanted people not to not to get trained in New York and stay in New York. Every We all deserve delicious food, so like come home. And then they worked with their national network to create an internship program, a mentorship program, so where women could go and work for other women kitchen, in other women kitchens for a period of time, and then they could come back to Kentucky and uh 
and the and the region. And it was it's an amazing program. But one of the other things that they did, there was a a, a murder of a barbecue chef in Louisville, David McAtee, and you know he was and he's not a he was not a celebrity chef. He's not celebrated, but he was a beloved community member, and. So they started the McEntee Community Kitchen because so they took one of their Lee Initiative mentees, uh, Nikita Rhodes, and and helped set up that kitchen. And that is an amazing, and that kitchen helps feed people who need to be fed because that was David's sort of legacy was that he was always gathering folks. And feeding and, people. <laughs> and feeding people. And so, you know, I, I love that. I mean, the Lee Initiative is one of my favorite culinary-led organizations because they really do embody that spirit of finding a problem that needs to be solved and helping solve it. So, you know, they also partnered with Heinz to give grants to Black-owned businesses that that program still continues, the mentorship still program still continues. So they also build things to last. And, you know, Edward and Lindsay are amazing humans. Yeah, the McAtee Kitchen does not just feed people, it also provides job training and education and partnerships to support Black farmers and also Black-owned restaurants, like su- somehow supporting or partnering with Black-owned restaurants. So yeah, that was that was really exciting to hear about just a couple hours south of here in Louisville. It's a, it's a great community project and, you know, Edward and Lindsay, if you have the opportunity to check out the Lee Initiative in this area, I would absolutely, it's totally worth your time. It's time for a short break. When we come back, we'll hear more from Catherine Miller. Stay with us. This is Earth Eats. I'm Kate Young. Let's get back to my conversation with Catherine Miller, author of At the Table, The Chef's Guide to Advocacy. So could you, I want to hear a little bit more about the approach that the Chef's Boot Camp for Policy Change makes. Like you have this whole structure of A is for advocacy. And could you just walk us through that? I know, you know, you obviously can't tell us all about it, but just no, no, no. hit some of the points. Yeah. No, I'm happy to. I mean, it's just like a fun little thing. So when we think about, you know, alliteration works when we talk about communications trainings and those sorts of things, like alliteration always works. And, you know, it's sort of thinking about a way to articulate all of the assets that a chef and even each of us has, and then also an approach. So when we're building advocacy efforts, whether they're just simply how we're going to write a letter to advocate for a bouncy house in our community, which is a very real thing right now in our community here, or whether it's to fight for SNAP benefits, you can break it down into sort of the A is advocacy framework. Who is the audience? So who is the person that makes the decision? and who can do the thing you want them to do. Who are your allies that are making the same case that you are? So I look for allies or stakeholders, which are like kind of on your side folks, people that can help amplify what you're trying to say. What is the argument you're trying to make? What is, why is this thing important? And why should anyone care? So what that, the argument, and then there's always got to be an ask, we always have to ask for something, whether it's to sponsor a piece of legislation, whether it's to sign a petition, but you need to give somebody something to do. And so th- that is a very important piece of that. And sometimes I could be showing up at a rally, show, sometimes I can be like asking a member of Congress to sponsor a piece of legislation. Sometimes that can be a very specific funding number, but you always have to have that. And that ask should always be followed by a thank you, by the way, which is not an A, but um, maybe acknowledgement. You know, and then I think the last, yes, right? Oh, I did it. I did it. I made it an A. It's the acknowledgement of the support. And then I think that, you know, one thing that we forget is that you have to make it easy for people to find each other. So I'm of a generation where everybody knows what a pink ribbon is or what a yellow bracelet is, right? Breast cancer, cancer surviving, a teal ribbon, rainbow flag. All of those things are visual iconography that help us find the people that are like us. And now that's done in hashtags. So Bakers Against Racism, it's a story in the book. And they used that hashtag, Bakers Against Racism. It's for other people to be able to find them. It's why every post around the chef's boot camp is tagged with 
chefs lead so that the chefs can find each other and like-minded people can find each other. And so that sort of article or, um, you know, that visual advocacy is a big piece of it. So, you know, I, those frames, like I always say in trainings, like if you can remember nothing, just remember A is for advocacy. It starts with your audience and it moves all the way through to the end to like, how can you help people find each other? And that is really like the article or the visual advocacy piece. And, uh, and there are some steps along the way, but yeah, yeah, it's attention. really was meant to be an e- it was meant to be an easy recipe for anybody to follow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think I think it works really well. I feel like it's it's kind of impossible to talk about the restaurant industry and not talk about COVID and the pandemic and the impact that it had. Um, it was really a crisis for the industry, but you also talk about it as as a possible turning point. Could you say more about that? Yeah, I mean, COVID was. COVID was a horrible time for the restaurant industry. Members, I remember sitting at the James Beard Foundation the first weeks in March and literally from Seattle to New York watching just restaurants close because no one knew what to do or how to do it. And it was like a, a dominoes. It was like, poof, 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 poof. and we hosted a conference call and we crashed WebEx, which was like pre-Zoom. Like we had 1,500 people try and call in on the same exact minute because everybody was so craving information. And out of that chaos, what I thought were some amazing, really hopeful things. One is that we have now have more data than ever before about how many people work in restaurants, how much it costs to run a restaurant, how much it costs to staff a restaurant, how much every product is. We, we didn't have it before, and it was really an interesting moment when we were trying to advocate for dollars you know, in Congress, and they're like, well, you know, the cruise industry contributes X, Y, Z to the economy. And nobody had a simple case study about what the restaurant industry, like, presents to the economy. And so, uh, but now we have that data. And as I see restaurants reopen and continue to reopen and now also stabilize, you know, two plus years on in this crisis, we are watching people make different decisions and different decisions that benefit their employees, that benefit their purveyors, ultimately end up putting more delicious things on the plate. And some of that is, you know, the elimination of the sub-minimum wage. So people are putting service charges on their bills. Some of that is an articulation on their bills of what those service charges cover, understanding that they need to supply mental health care or they need to make sure that they have a fund for babysitting. So that, you know, that was incredibly hopeful that, you know, for the first time we sort of know all that and that people are making fundamentally different decisions about how to run their restaurant and run their business and, you know, what that is going to mean for the next set of wave of restaurateurs and entrepreneurs that come up post-COVID is, is really, it's, it's amazing. And, it's so, and it was also an amazing, heartwarming story about how they rallied, not only on behalf of like their, their businesses, but their workers during COVID too, really the economic benefits and all the things that they did. So, yeah. Yeah. And just all the stories about restaurants feeding people in their communities and, you know, showing up in the ways that they could. Yeah, I mean, restaurants, you know, turned themselves into community pantries. They did you know, emergency feeding meals. They, I mean, when they couldn't open their doors, they still opened their doors and fed their communities. And so it's really, um, they really are, are, they really are enshrined along our world of first responders you see it in the work of Jose Andres and World Central Kitchen. They're always the first people into a disaster, into a crisis situation. And chefs are the first people that we ask for donations or contributions. And so we certainly we certainly view them that way, even if we don't always treat them that way. Since you mentioned that again, I just wanted to follow up about what you were talking about with the where restaurants were maybe choosing to say no to the multiple asks that they had and just just focus in on one to to have a larger impact. But I also feel like what you were just talking about is how part of the role that they play in a community is that they're the person who supplies the food for your whatever, your fundraiser or your and and that's part of how they connect with all 
the folks in their community and yeah. then can play that advocacy role when speaking to Yeah, no, it's definitely I mean, it's definitely a little bit of a double edged sword, so to speak, right? Like you are the first person that everybody asks and then you're the person that we're telling you to hone your hone hone your focus. But also remember there's lots of them. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of restaurants across this country. We don't all need to ask the amazing Tom Clicchio and his restaurant group for a restaurant card, for a gift card. We don't all have to do that. We can ask other people in the community and they would happily help. So if you hear, if if you as an eater hear no from somebody, ask why, and then find somebody who is aligned with you, right? Because like, there it's, I, I do feel like there's a little bit of a, we all have the right to care about the things that we care about and to hone our interests. And there's also hundreds of thousands of them <laughs> and they're not all doing this work. But if you ask, you know, if you, if, if we as eaters or the nonprofit community kind of also diversify our asks a little, you'd be surprised at the relationships. I, I always talk about that, like the nonprofit community in particular views this, the culinary community as transactional. The nonprofit community sells tickets to fundraisers based off the chefs who participate. Most of the people who come to that fundraiser have never heard of that chef. It's just a unique night out, like blah, blah, blah. So go find the chefs that like are amazing. Go highlight the black women chefs. Like go highlight the chefs in your community who are doing great work, who come from different populations, because you will build authentic relationships with them. So I'm a I'm a huge proponent and also support them. Don't ask them to do it for free, but yeah, I think I hear what you're saying is maybe organizations could think about spreading it out a little bit. I know when I worked for a nonprofit that we definitely had our favorites and people who either we already had relationships with them or we just for some reason liked something about what they do and they had said yes in the past or we knew another organization they said yes to and so they do tend to be like a few restaurants in town that got asked over and over again and over and over and over again yes and eventually they had to be like uh we've already done our you know we've got our seven organizations this year we're tapped out like (laughs) we're tapped out right but also like I just think from the nonprofit community perspective we also have to be better and more intentional about the relationships that we're trying to build. And then we need to move out of this transactional, ridiculous transactional world we're in and move into this time of sort of like deep meaning, right? So that chef who did your fundraiser every year, is that chef also now on your advisory board? Is that chef now also part of your community planning? Is that chef now also part of your ecosystems of donors because they've given you so much? I'm going to venture to guess no. I'm going to venture to guess most donors come to them six weeks before. Most organizations would come back to them like six weeks before and be like, you cook last year, you're going to cook this year, right? And they wouldn't have heard anything from you, right? So like I, I also think as the nonprofit community needs to be thinking about how it acknowledges the contribution of all of its donors, but certainly those that ask for free labor, free time, free gifts. And it needs to move from transaction to real community. Right, right. And and you're right, it does always come across as transactional. It's kind of, it is a two-way transaction in that, hey, your name gets on here or everyone knows that you donated or whatever. But it that's different from a relationship that's being built. It's very and different like from said, a relationship. And it's also very different from a power dynamic. What we like to say in the culinary industry is no more for exposure events. Like exposure doesn't pay someone's rent. Exposure doesn't take into account the time that they took out to work that fundraiser. And so when people ask people to do that, we call it the schlep and cook in the industry. You're asking them to come. You're asking them to cook. They're probably going to have done prep for it. And the organization is asking them to do it for free. And maybe you give them a gift back. Uh, maybe maybe they get the ingredients, but they don't get the time. And that that is gone. Like that has to be gone from all of our thinking as nonprofit organizations and leaders. If you're going to have a fundraiser, you need to, uh, nonprofit leaders need to adequately resource the people that they're coming and using their work. It doesn't have to be their full rate 
great. It doesn't have to be exorbitant, but it does have to factor in the time and expertise and treasure that people are giving to the cause. And so like in the culinary industry, I think you'll see more people saying no to places if they're not going to pay because it also becomes a point of privilege and economic privilege because it's usually the it's usually white men business owners who can say yes all the time and so you look at it really limits your ability to reach different audiences and to engage different communities because your BIPOC restaurateurs do not have the same capacity time or money to give in the same way that white restaurateurs have so yeah that's a that's a whole soapbox for me and I could go on for an hour (laughs) No, it's such a good point, and I'm glad I'm glad we came back to it and talked about it a little bit more because it was just kind of I was stewing on it a little bit. So yeah, thank you. That's really helpful. I really appreciate this. Is there anything that you wanted to add that we didn't get to? I mean, I know there's lots of things we didn't get to, but is there something that you just definitely want to? No, I mean, I think add? I think that we all have the power to be an advocate, and I think if you are an eater, I hope that at the table. The Chef's Guide to Advocacy gives you an entryway into food systems work and you'll join all the chefs and others who are doing great work to change our food system to something that's more delicious and sustainable and just for us all. And, you know, just use your voice because you have one. That was Catherine Miller, author of At the Table, The Chef's Guide to Advocacy, released in September 2023 with Island Press. You can find links to her work on our website, eartheats.org. The Earth Eats team includes Violet Barron, Aabon Binder, Alexis Carvajal, Alex Chambers, Mark Chilla, Toby Foster, Daniela Richardson, Samantha Schemenauer, Peyton Whaley, and Harvest Public Media. Earth Eats is produced and edited by me, Kate Young. Our theme music is composed by Aaron Toby and performed by Aaron and Matt Toby. Additional music on the show comes to us from Universal Production Music. Our executive producer is Eric Bolstridge. Mm-hmm.